Hi folks, this is Jason. Hope you're all okay today. I'm just going to read a part of a sermon called The Preacher's Power and the Conditions of Obtaining It, Brethren, by the Charles Spurgeon. Uh, sorry, I was going to read the sermon there. By Charles Spurgeon, a great Baptist preacher, June 1889. You're right, brethren, we want to do our rightly and effectively and we cannot do it without power. Of course, no work of any kind is accomplished in this world without a certain expenditure of force, and the force employed differs according to the matter in hand. The sort of power which we feel in need will be determined by our view of our work, and the amount of power that we shall long for will also vary much depending upon our idea of how that work shall be done. I speak as unto a wise man, who know their object and know also whence their strength must come. I speak also to men who mean to use their office as in the sight of God, but I think it desirable to stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance and put you and myself in mind of the grand desire of which we need power. We could be ministers of some men are ministers without any particular power, either natural or acquired, merely to perform service, to use an ugly word, perfunctorily, does not require special endowments. Any speaking machine might do as well. There are ministers whose sermons and whose whole services are so much a matter of routine and so utterly lifeless that if power from high were to come upon them, it would altogether bewilder them. Nobody would know them to be the same person. The change would seem too great. The same things are said in the same tone and manner year after year. I have heard of a preacher whom one of his people likened to a steeple which had but two bells in it. From he said, it's always ding dong, ding dong, ding dong, <laughs> ding dong. Paul said his friends, you might, you ought to be abundantly grateful that you have as much variety as that. For our man has only one bell and his voice is forever ding, 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 ding. And this is the case among nonconformists. It ruins the congregations, for it is death to every possibility of collecting people to hear, and still more is it murder to all hope of their being improved if they do hear. I should think it is by no means difficult with a liturgy to be read without much alteration all the year round, to become a fine example of either the ding dong or the ding 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 with us, whose devotion is of a free sort. There is less excuse for monotony, and if we fall into the fault, the result will be more disastrous. It is possible, even without a liturgy, to pray in a very set and formal style. Indeed, it is so possible as to be frequent, and then the long prayer become a severe affliction upon an audience. The shorter prayers are, are not much better. When I have thought of the preaching of a certain good man, I have wondered not with the, that the congregation was so small, but that it was so large. The people who listen to them ought to excel in the virtue of patience, for they have grand opportunities for exercising it. <laughs> He's a good spirit. I have frequently said of myself that I would not go across the road to hear myself preach, but I will venture to say of a certain brethren that I would, I would even go across the road in the other direction not to hear them preach. Some sermons and prayers lend a call of support to the theory of Dr. William Hammond that the brain is not absolutely essential to life. Brethren, I trust that not even one of you will be content with mechanical services devoid both of mental and spiritual force. You will none of you covet earnestly the least gifts and dullest mannerisms, for you can obtain them without excursion of the will. You desire to do your master's work as it ought to be done, and therefore you long for excellent gifts and still more excellent graces. You wish that people may attend to your discourse because there is something in it worthy of their attention. You labor to discharge your ministry, not with lifeless method of an automaton, but with the freshness and power which will render your ministry largely effectual for its scarce purpose. I am bound to say also that our object certainly is not to please or our clients, nor to preach to the times, nor to be in touch with modern progress, nor to gratify the cultured few. Our life work cannot be answered by the utmost acceptance on earth. Our record is on high, or it will be written in the sand. 
there is no need whatsoever that you and I should be chaplains of the modern spirit, for it is well supplied with busy advocates. Surely Ahab does not need Messiah to prophesy smooth things to him, for there are already 400 prophets of the grove who are flattering him with one consent. We are reminded of the protesting Scotch divine in evil days who was exhorted by the synod to preach to the times. He asked, do you brethren preach to the times? They boasted that they did. Well then, said he, if there are too many of you who preach for the times, you may well allow one poor brother to preach for eternity. We leave without regret the people of the hour to the men of the hour. With such eminently cultured persons forever hurrying on with their new doctrines, the world may be content to let our little company keep to the old-fashioned faith, which will still believe to have been once and for all delivered to the saints. <laughs> I love Spurgeon. Don't you just love the guy? He's just awesome. Those superior persons who are so wonderfully advanced and may be annoyed that we cannot consort with them, but nevertheless so it is that it is not now and never will be, any design of ours to be in harmony with the spirit of the age, or in the least desirous to conciliate the, the demon of doubt which rules the present moment. Brethren, we shall not adjust our Bible to the age, but before we have done with it, by God's grace, we shall adjust the age to the Bible. We shall not fall into the error that absent-minded doctor had to cook for himself an egg, and therefore depositing his watch in the saucepan, he stood steadfastly looking at the egg. The change to be wrought is not for the divine chronometer, but for the poor egg of human thought. We make no mistake here, we shall not watch our congregation to take our cue from it, but we shall keep our eye on the infallible word and preach according to its instructions. Our master sits on high and not in the chairs of the scribes and the doctors who regulate the theories of the century. We cannot take our keynote from the wealthier people nor from the leading officers nor even from the former ministers. How often have we heard an excuse for heresy made out of the desire to impress thoughtful young men? Young men, whether thoughtful or otherwise, are best impressed by the gospel, and it's folly to, to, to dream that a preaching which leaves out the truth is suitable to men, either old or young. We shall not quit the word to please the young man, nor even the young woman. This truckling to you young men is a mere pretense. Young men are not more found of false doctrine than the middle-aged, and if they are, there is no such the more necessity to teach them better. Young men are more impressed by the old gospel than by emphrial speculations. If any of you wish to preach a gospel that will be pleasing to the times, preach it in the power of the devil, and I have no doubt that he will willingly do his best for you. It is not much such... It is not to such servants of men that I desire to speak just now. I trust that if ever any of you should err from the faith and take up with the new theology, you will be too honest to pray for the power from God with which to preach them that mischievous delusion. And if you should do, you will be guilty of the constructive blasphemy. No, brethren, it is not our object to please men, but our design is a far noble one. To begin with, it is our great desire to bear witness to the truth. I believe, and the conviction grows upon me, that even to know the truth is the gift of the grace of God, and that to love the truth is the work of the Holy Spirit. I am speaking now not about a natural knowledge or a natural love to divine things, if such there be, but of an experimental knowledge of Christ and a spiritual love to him. These are as much the gift of God in the preacher as the work of conversion with, will be the work of God in the hearers. We desire so thoroughly to know and so heartily to love the truth as to declare the whole counsel of God and speak it as we ought to speak. No small labor this. To proclaim the whole system of truth and to deal out each part in due portion is by no means a simple matter. To bring out each doctrine according to the analogy of faith and set each truth in its proper place is no easy task. It is easy to make a caricature of the beautiful face of truth by omitting one doctrine and generating another. We may dishonor the most lovely continence by giving it to its most striking feature and importance, which puts it out of proportion with the rest. For our beauty greatly consists in balance and harmony, to know the truth as it should be known, to love it as it should be loved, and then to proclaim it in the right spirit and in its proper portion is no small work for such feeble creatures as we are. In this grand yet delicate labor, we have to persevere year after year. 
What power can enable us to do this while so many complain of the monotony of the old gospel and feel a perpetual itching for something new? This disease may even infect our own hearts. This is an evil to be fought against with our whole being. When we feel dull and stale, we must not imagine that the truth of God is so. Nay, rather, by returning more closely to the word of God, we must renew our freshness. To continue always steadfast in it, so that our latest testimony shall be identical in substance with our first testimony, only deeper, mellower, more assured, and more intense. This is such a labor that for it we must needs have the power of God. Do you not feel this? I pray you feel it more and more, O oh brethren. If you propose to be a true witness for God, your proposal is a very glorious one, and it will tend to make you feel the truth of what I am about to say, namely that a more than human power must guide you and make you sufficient for the difficult enterprise. Your object, however, to, so to bear your personal witness that others may be convinced thereby of the truth of what is so sure to your own soul, in this there are difficulties, not a few, for our hearers are not anxious to believe the revelation of God. Some of them are desirous not to do so. In the reign of Queen Elizabeth, an order went forth that everybody should go to the parish church at least once on the Sunday. Of course, the bulk of people were still Romish, and it went much against the grain of them to attend the Reformed services. I have read that when Romanists did go to the services prescribed by law, Many of them put wool into their ears that they might not hear. In a moral sense, this practice is still in vogue. Certain parts of the truth men will hear, but other portions are disagreeable to them, and their ears are dull of hearing. You know, for you believe in the original sin of men, about the only thing original there is in many, how Satan has most effectively blind the minds of the ungodly, so that speak, so that speak we as wisely and as we may, and as persuasively as we can, nothing but a miracle convince men dead in sin of the truth of God. Nothing less than a miracle of grace can lead a man to receive what is altogether opposite to his nature. I shall not attempt to teach the ti a tiger the doctrine of vegetarianism, but I shall hopefully attempt the task as I would try to insert an ungenerate man of the truths revealed by God concerning sin and righteousness and judgment to come. These spiritual truths are repugnant to carnal men, and the carnal mind cannot receive the things of God. Gospel's truth is diametrically opposed to fallen nature. And if I have not power much stronger than that which lies in mortal persuasion, or in my own explanation and arguments, I have undertaken a task in which I am sure of defeat. Well said the writer of one of our hymns when he spoke of the Holy Spirit. Tis thine the passions to recall, and upward bid them rise, and make the scales of error fall from reason's darkened eyes. Except the Lord endows with power from on high, our labor must be in vain, and our hope must end in disappointment. This is but the threefold of our labor. Our innermost longing is to call out a people who shall be the Lord's separated heritage. A new theory has lately been started, which forth as its ideal, a certain imaginary kingdom of God, unspiritual, unscriptural, and unreal. The old-fashioned way of seeking the lost sheep, one by one, is too slow. It takes too much time and thought and prayer, and it does not leave space enough for politics, gymnastics, and sing-song. We are urged to rake in the nation's wholesale into his imagery kingdom by sanitary regulations, social arrangements, scientific accommodations, and legislative enactments. Please the people with word democratic, and then amuse them into morality. This is the last few fads according to this fancy. Our Lord's kingdom is, after all, to be this world, and without conversion or the new birth, the whole population is to melt into an earthly theocracy. Albeit it is not so, it seems to me that the Lord will follow the lines of the Old Testament economy still and separate to himself a people who shall be in the midst of the world as the Lord's kings and priests a peculiar people zealous for good works. I see in the new covenant not less but even more of the election of grace, whereby a people is called out and consecrated to the Lord. Through the chosen ones, Mariad shall be born unto God, but beside these I know of no other kingdom. Brethren, the election of grace, which is so often denounced, is a fact which men need not speak against, 
since they do not themselves desire to be elected. I never can make out why a man should cavail at another being chosen when he does not himself want to be wish to be chosen. If he wishes that he were chosen to repentance, if he desired holiness, if he longs to be the Lord, and if that desire to be true, he is chosen already. But seeing that he does not desire anything of this kind, why does he cavail with others who have received this blessing? Ask an ungodly man whether he would take up the humble, often abused and persecuted position of the lowly follower of Christ and onto the idea. If it were possible for him to get into a position for a time, how gladly would he shuffle out of it? He likes to be in the swim and to side with the majority. But to be like a fish, to force his way up the stream, is not according to his desire. He prefers a worldly religion with abundant provision for the flesh. Religious worldliness suits him very well, but to be out and out for Jesus, called out from the world and consecrated to obedience, is not his ambition. Do you not see in this your need of an extraordinary power? To call men out to a real separation from the world and a true union with Christ apart from the power of God is an utterly futile event, effort. Go whistle eagles into an English sky or beckon dolphins to the dry land or lure Lethian till thou play him as with a bird and then attempt this greater task. They will not come, they have no wish to come and even so our Lord and Master warns us when he said, you will not come under me that you might have life. They will read the Bible, you search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, but they will not come to the Lord himself, that is to spiritual for their taste. No, the command, repent ye and believe the gospel, is too hard, too sharp, too humbling for them. Is not this enough to appeal to you? Do you go forward unless your Lord shall gird you with heavenly power? Stop, we have only yet begun. They are called out, but there is something further to be done through the instrumentality of our ministry. Our hearers have to be born again and made new creatures in Christ Jesus or else our preaching has done nothing for them. Our dear friends, we get into deep waters when we come to this great mystery. Does any unregenerate man know the meaning of being born again? Ask the learned doctors whether they know anything about it and they will try to conceal their ignorance beneath a sneer. Ask them if they think there is anything in it and and they will perhaps reply, yes, there's such a phenomenon for many respectable and even scientific people have repressed the, the subjects of it. Still they smile and express the wonder that it is so. The confession of many a candid scientist is that it may be so, but he is not himself able to comprehend it. Why then do they not hold their tongues? If they had not experienced the new birth, that fact is no proof that others have not. Why do they sneer if they were our superiors? The regenerate is this matter, our necessary their superiors. A person who has only one eye is a king among blind men. Let not the blind affect to despise him. If any of us have personally experienced the new birth, even though we may be ignorant of many other things, we are in this point better instructed than those who have never felt the divine change. But just in proportion as you know what it is to be born again, you will feel that therein is a task indeed how sublime a position for you to become under God the spiritual parents of men. You could not create a fly, much less could you create a new heart and a right spirit to fashion a world as less difficulty in it than to create a new life in an ungodly man. For in the creation of the world there was nothing in the way of God, but in the creation of the new heart there is the old nature opposing the spirit. The negative has to be remo removed as well as the positive produced. Stand and look that matter over and see if you are at all able in and of yourself to work the conversation or regeneration of a single child in your Sunday school. My brethren, we are at the end of ourselves here. If we aim at the new birth of our hearers, we must fall prostrate before the Lord in conscience importance, impotence, conscience impotence. And we must not gain to our pulpits till we have heard our Lord say, My grace is sufficient for you, for my grace is made perfect in weakness. Supposing that to be done, remember those who are brought to God are to be kept preserved to the end. And your longing is that your ministry should be the means of keeping them from stumbling and holding them fast in the way of righteousness even to the end. Do you propose to that of yourselves? How presumptuous! Why look at the temptations which pollute this city? I suppose that the seductions of evil are much the same in smaller towns as in the villages, though differing in form. 
their name is legion for they are many look at the temptations which assail our youth in the literature of ayah have you even a slender acquaintance with the popular literature do you wonder what the weak minds are made to stumble the wonder is that any are preserved yet this is only one of many death bearing agencies how great is the leakage in our churches the most faithful minister has to complain of the loss of many who appear to run well but have been hindered so that they do not obey the truth the great heap that we have gathered upon the threshing floor is sadly diminished when he comes whose fan is in his hand but we do not propose nevertheless to be the means in the hands of God of leading the sheep to pasture and continuing to lead them until they feed on the hilltops of heaven with the great shepherd himself in the mist but what a task we have undertaken how shall we present them to Christ as pure virgins how can we keep them from the pollution of the all surrounding Sodom how shall we at the last be able to say here I am and the children thou hast given me brethren we cannot do it at all but the Lord can do it through us by the energy of his grace if you have half a dozen convents, how greatly you will praise God if you pass with half a dozen at your side safely through the gates of pearl. Certain of us know many thousands whom have instrumentally brought to the Saviour, but unless we have power infinitely greater than our own, how shall we shepherd them to the end? We may announce them as converts, we may associate with them as workers, and feel thankful for them as fellow heirs, yet bitter may be our disappointment, with all comes to all, and they turn aside unto perdition. How grievous to be to all appearances rich in usefulness, and on a sudden to find that our converts are like money put into a bag that is full of holes, and that our treasure converts fall out, because they were not truly gathered to the Lord Jesus after all. It was sufficient for these things. Weak we are, exceeding weak, every one of us. If there is any brother here who is weaker than usual and knows that he is so, let him not be at all cast down about that. For you see, brethren, the best man here, if he knows what he is, knows that he is out of his depth in this sacred calling. Well, if you're out of your depth, it does not matter whether the sea is 40 feet or full smile. If the sea is only a fathom deep you will drown if you be not unborn and if it be altogether unfathomable you cannot be more than drowned the weakest man here is not in the business really any weaker than the strongest man since the whole whole affair is quite beyond us else work miracles by divine power or else be total failures we have all set up the divine profession of working by omnipotence or rather of yielding ourselves up to omnipotence that it may work by us if therefore omnipotence be not with hail and if the miracle working power is not with us then the sooner we go home and plow the fields or open shop or cast up accounts the better wherefore should we undertake what we have not the power to perform supernatural work needs supernatural power and if you have not and if you have it not do not I pray you attempt to do the work alone Lest like Samson, when he locks were shorn, you should become the jest of the Philistines. This supernatural force is the power of the Holy Ghost, the power of Jehovah himself. It is the wonderful thing that God should condescend to work his marvels of grace through men. It is strange that instead of speaking and saying with his own lips, let there be light, speaks the illuminated word by our lips instead of fashioning a new heaven and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness by mere fate of his power he couples himself with our weakness and performs his purpose do you not marvel that he should treasure his gospel in these poor earthen vessels and accomplish the miracles which I very briefly described by messengers who are themselves so utterly unable to meet him in the essential parts of his heavenly work turn your wonder into adoration and blend with your adoration a fervent cry for divine power O Lord work by us to the praise of thy glory part two part two First, we need a purpose to consider the way in which we are to obtain the power we much desire. We need to feel it within ourselves when we are receiving our message. In order to have power in public, we must receive power in secret. I trust that no brother here would venture to address his people without getting a message fresh from his Lord. 
if you de deliver a stale story of your own concocting, or if you speak without a fresh anointing from the Holy One, your ministry will come to nothing. Words spoken on your own account without reference to your Lord will fall to the ground. When the footman goes to the door to answer a call, he asks his master what he has to say. He repeats that what his master tells him. You and I are waiting servants in the house of God and we are to report what our God would have us speak. The Lord gives the soul saving message and close it with power. He gives it a certain order of people and under certain conditions. Among those conditions I notice first a simplicity of heart. The Lord pours most, pours most into those who are most empty of self. Those who have least of their own shall have the most of God's. The Lord cares little what the vessel is, whether a golden or earthen, so long as it is clean and disengaged from other uses. He sees whether there is anything in the cup, and if so, he throws it all out. Only then is the cup prepared to receive the living water. If there is something in it before, it will adulterate the pure word. Or if what was before was very pure, it would at least occupy some of the room which the Lord seeks for his own grace. The Lord therefore empties us that we may be clear of the prejudice, self-sufficiency and foregone conclusions as to what his truth ought to be. He would have us like children who believe that their father tells them we must lay aside all pretense of wisdom. Some men are too self-sufficient for God to use. If God were to, to bless them largely, they would talk in Wolseley style. I am my king, but the Lord will have none of it. The straight back upstart letter I must bow itself down into its lower case shape and just look like a little pot hook of a thing and be nothing more or to be rid of self or to quit every pretense of wisdom many are very superior persons and so when they get God's message they correct it interpolate it their own ideas they dream that the old gospel cannot be quite suitable to these enlightened days when everything is done by stream and men and killed by powder they not only interpolate, but they omit because they judge that certain truths have become obsolete by the lapse of time. In this way, what with additions and abstractions, little is left of the pure words of God. The apostles are generally the first to be sent adrift. Poor Paul, poor Paul, he has come in, in for very hard lines just lately as if the Spirit of God did not speak through Paul with as much authority as when he spoke through the Lord Jesus. Note well how God designed to put himself on a level with his apostles when he says, The word which you hear is not mine, but the Father's which sent me. And in his final prayer, he prayed for those who would believe on him through the apostles' word, as much as to say that if they would not believe on him through the word of the apostle, they would not believe at all. John, speaking of himself and his fellow apostles, has said, By the Holy Ghost, he that knoweth God, he with us. He that is not of God, he is not of us. Hereby know we the truth of the Spirit and the truth and the Spirit of error. This is the test of believers at the present time. The rejection of the apostles condemns the modern school. Brethren, may the Lord give us great humility of mind. It ought not to be an extraordinary thing for us to accept what God says. It ought not to take much humility for such poor creatures as we are to sit at Jesus' feet. We ought to look upon it as the elevation of mind for us to lie prostrate before an infinite wisdom assuredly this is needful to the reception from God the power from God I have noticed too that if God's power comes to a man with a message he not only has a childlikeness of mind but he has also a singleness of eye such a man trying to hear what God the Lord shall speak is also here he honestly and eagerly desires to know what God's mind is and he applies all faculties to the reception of the divine communication and he drinks in the sacred message with a complete surrender of soul he is resolved to give it out with entire concentration of his mental and spiritual powers and with a single eye to the glory of God unless you have put one eye and that one eye sees Christ in his glory and the salvation of men God will not use you the man whose eyes cannot look straight on must not be admitted a priest unto the living God there are certain defects which cut a man off with divine employ and anything like a motive is one of them if you aim at making money winning is securing approbation or obtaining position or even if you aim at the exhibition of rhetorical talent you will not be able to fit the master's use God will not have us entangled with subordinate designs 
You do not keep a servant to go to the door that the people may say, what a fine girl she is and how charming she dresses. You may smile if it is so and put up with it, but your sole wish is to have your message promptly and faithfully delivered. How contentable it is when a minister so acts as to give the idea of childless, childish display. He stands up to deliver his Lord's message, but his hope is that people will say, What a nice young man, how properly he speaks, and how prettily he quotes Browning. Self-pity is death to power. Self-display is death to power. God cannot largely bless men with such small ideas. It were beneath the dignity of the Godhead for the Lord largely to use an instrument so altogether unadapted for his sublime purpose. Beloved, I notice that God imparts his message to those who have complete subordination to him. I will tell you what has often crossed my mind when I have talked with certain brethren or I have read their lucubrations. I have wondered which was the master, which was the servant, the man or God. I have been sorry for the errors of these brethren. But I have been far more distressed by the spirit shown in those errors. It is heaven that they have renounced that holy reverence for scripture, which is indicated by a such expression as this, that trembleth at my word. They rather trifle than tremble. The word is not their teacher, but they are its critics. The word of the Lord is no longer enthroned in the place of honor with many, but the word of the Lord is no longer enthroned in the the place of honor with many, but treated as a football to be kicked about as they please, and the apostles especially are treated as if Paul and James and John were Jack, Tom and Harry, with whom modern wise men are on terms of something more than equality. They pass the books of Scripture under their rod and just the Spirit of God Himself. The Lord cannot work by a creature that is in revolt against Him, and we must manifest the spirit of reverence, or we shall not be a little children, nor enter the kingdom of heaven. When some men come to die, and the religion which they themselves thought out and invented will yield them no more confidence than the religion of the Roman Catholic Sepulchre, who on his deathbed was visited by the priest. The priest said, You are now departing out of this life, and holding up a beautiful crucifix, he cried, Behold your God who died for you. Alas, said the sculptor, I made it. There was no comfort for him in the work of his own hands, and there will be no comfort in a religion of one's own devising, that which that which was created in the brain cannot yield comfort to the heart. The man will sorrowfully say, yes, that is my own idea, but what does God say? Brethren, I believe in that which I could not have invented. I believe that which I cannot understand. I believe that which compels me to adore, and I thank God for a rock that is higher than I. If it were not higher than I, it were not a shelter for me. Be still, says one. We must be earnest students of the literature, of the period and the science of the age. Yes, I did not say you were not to be so, but keep them in subordination to the word of God. When the Israelites took captive in battle, it sometimes happened that among the prisoners there was a woman whom the captain might desire to marry, and the Lord did not forbid the alliance. But have you ever noticed the command to shave her head and pur her nails? This must be done most carefully with all the literature of this period, whether it be secular or religious, whether it deal with fact or fiction. The shaving will need to be very close and the pairing to be very careful even when these operations are performed and one will still see to question whether the subject of them had not after all to be better let alone. There is an instructive precept of the ceremonial law which shuts out some things from ever being used in the service of the Lord. I quote it with trembling, Thou shall not bring the hire of a harlot or the price of a dog into the house of God. I question whether in quoting certain poets and authors we may not be contriving the statue. When men's lives have been foul and their principles atheistic, there should be great hesitation as to quoting their language. The blasphemer of the living God is hardly to be mentioned in the Lord's house, however fine may have been the product of his rebellious heart. At any rate, all that is of man, even the best of man, must be altogether subordinate to the word of the Lord. I have mentioned simplicity of character, singleness of eye, and subordination of mind. Next to these I notice all that if God will use to use us, there must be a deep seriousness of heart. Let, rem let me remind you again of that text, that trembleth at my word. When George Fox was called a Quaker, 
because he trembled at the name of God, the title was an honor to him. The man was so God-possessed that he quaked as well he might. And Habakkuk described the same feeling as having been his own no unusual experience with the true child of God. Sorry. Habakkuk describes the same feeling as having been his own. No unusual experience with the true child of God. In fact, God never comes to us without our trembling. The old Romanist legend in that the tree that bore the Savior was the aspen, whose leaves continually quiver. He that bears Christ within him and feels the weight of the divine glory must be filled with awe. Our brother Williams just now now said that he feared and trembled all the goodness that God had passed to before him. This is my feeling and yours. We are so weak and these divine inspirations are so weighty that we are subdued into awe and there is no room for levity. Brethren, avoid anything like trifling over sermon making. Someone says, well, I take very little time over my sermon. Make no boast of that. It may be your sin. Listen, if a man has been put apprentice to cabinet making and had worked at it for a lifetime it may be he would have a great deal of skill and a store of prepared material so that he could turn out a chair in a short time but you must not therefore think that you could do the same and that cabinet work is mere child's play a certain minister may compose a sermon in a short time but you must remember that this is the result of labor of many years even he who according to common parlance speaks quite extemporally it does not re really do so. It delivers what he has in previous years stored up. The mill is full of corn, and therefore when you put a sack in the proper place, it is filled with the flour in a short time. Do not regard preparation for the pulpit as a trifling thing. and Do not rush about your holy duties without devout, devout fitness for the hallowed service. Make your waiting upon God a necessity of your young calling, your calling, and at the same time the highest privilege of it. Count it your joy and honor to have an interview with your master. Get your message fresh from God, even manna stinks if you keep it beyond its time. Therefore, get it fresh from heaven, and then it will have celestial, celestial relish. One thing upon this head, this power which we so greatly need in getting our message, will only come when there is a sympathy with God. Brethren, you know what it is to be a tender sympathy with God. Perhaps no man among us knows the perfect sympathy with God means, yet we must at at least be in a, such a cord as to feel that he could not do or say anything which we would question. We could not doubt any truth which he could reveal. Neither in our heart of hearts would we quarrel with anything which his will could appoint. If anything is in us is not in perfect agreement with the Lord, we regard it as evil and grown to be set free from it. If anything in us contends against God, we contend against it, for we are one with God in intent and desire. We hear much nowadays of sympathy with man, and in measure we agree with it. Sympathy with the fallen, the suffering, the lost, it is good. But my sympathies also are with the Lord my God. His name is dishonored, his glory is trailed in the mire. It is his dear, bleeding son that is wor worst used of all. Oh, to think that he should love so well and be refused, that such beauty as his should be acknowledged, such redemption rejected, such mercy scorned, what are men, after all, compared with God? If they are like myself, it were a pity that they were ever made. As for God, does he not fill a thing with goodness as well as with being? To me, Calvinism means the placing of eternal God at the head of all things. I look at everything through its re revelation to God's glory. I see God first and man far down in the list. We think too much of God to please things this age, but we are not ashamed. Man as a will... Or how we, they cry it up. One said the other day that there is some truth in it too. I attribute a kind of om omnipotence to the will of man. But sirs, has not God a will too? What do you attribute to that will? Have you nothing to say about its omnipotence? Is God to have no choice, no purpose, no sovereignty of his own gifts? Brethren, if we live in a sympathy with God, we delight to hear him say, I am God and beside me there is no one else. I can hardly tell you how high a value I set upon this enthusiasm for God. We must be in heart with all his designs of love towards men. Whilst in secret we receive his message to become apparently warm in the pulpit is not of much account unless we are much more intense along with God. Heart fire is true fire. A housewife who preserves 
in the old method of making her own bread does not want a great blaze at the mouth of the oven oh no she says i want to get my faggots far back and get all the heat into the oven itself and then it becomes of use to me servants are never baked by the fire and flash at the mouth they must be prepared through the heating of the innermost soul the precious word the divine shoe bread must be baked in the center of our nature by the heat that is put there by the indwelling spirit the Lord loves to use a man who is in perfect sympathy with him. I would not say anything unbecoming, but I believe that the Lord finds pleasure in the sympathy of his children. When you have been very happy of heart, even to weeping, if your little child has said, Dear Father, don't cry, or has asked, What are you crying for, Father? And then has brought into sobbing himself, Have you not been comforted by him? Poor dear, he does not understand what it is all about, but you say, Bless you, my dear child, and you kiss him and feel comfort to him. So did the Lord take up his poor weeping minister into his bosom and hear him cry, Lord, they will not come to thee. Lord, they will not believe thee. They are running after evil instead of thee, Lord. If I give them a play or a peach show, they would come in crowds. But if I preach the dear son, they will not hear me. The great God enters into your sorrow and finds a content in your lo heart's love. God is not a man, but a man was made in the image of God. We learn something of him from ourselves. He loves to clasp a sympathizing one to his bosom and then to say go my child and work in my name for I can trust my gospel in thy hand be with God and God will be with you espouse his cause and he will espouse yours there can be no question about this next follow me my brethren while I speak upon the power that it needs when we are delivering the message itself brethren if there is to be a divine result from God's word the Holy Ghost must come forth with it as surely as God went before Israel when he divided the Red Sea as surely as he led them through the wilderness by the pillar of crowd and fire so surely must the Lord's power his presence go with his word if there is to be any blessing from it how then are we to get the pr the priceless benediction great natural force of the world and when engineers wish to employ these forces they go to work in a certain manner suitable therein they cannot create power by mechanism, but they can utilize it and, and economize it. For instance, the wheel and pulley do not produce power, but by diminishing friction they prevent the waste of power. This is a great matter. We all can be great gainers by using methods of minimizing friction with this present evil world, which we unavoidably come into contact. Your own experience will teach you the wisdom of this. Look earnestly to the holy separateness of the spirit which shall preserve you from the distracting and downgrading tendencies of these things seen. Happily, there is another kind of friction, which has great power in developing latent force. Just as a certain form of electricity is produced by friction, so can we obtain power by coming into contact with God and by means of the spiritual effect of truth as it operates upon a willing and obedient heart. To be touched by the finger of God, ye to come into contact with even the hem of our master's garment is to obtain a heavenly energy and if we have much of it we shall be charged with sacred strength in a mysterious but very palpable way be much with God in holy dialogue let him speak to you by his word while you speak back to him by your prayers and praises so far you will obtain force the greatest generator of force which is available to man is he I suppose that nothing is so much power for human purpose as fire, even so, the burning and consuming element in the spiritual world is a great factor in the development of spiritual strength. We must be in downright earnest and must feel the burning of zeal which consumes us, or we shall have little force. We must decrease, we must be burning if we would be shining lights. We cannot save our lives and save others. There must be a destruction of self for the salvation of man. Many other things suggest themselves to me on this point, but I waive them all to come distinctly to the one most real and most sufficient power, namely the Holy Ghost, to whom be glory forevermore. In order to have the Holy Spirit with us, there must be a very close adhesion to the truth of God, with clearness, boldness, and fidelity in the utterance of it. Do not dream that to have a formal creed, or something which is said not to be a creed, but a declaration, or some other style of confession, I know not how to mention the non-script intention is enough without intensely hearty belief of truth 
These precious documents are wretched affairs, decorations of the kind I refer to many, be compared to flags which may be useful if carried by brave standard bearers, or they may be tawdry ornaments used for meaner ends. A teacher was once instructing a class in patriotism and nationality. He happened to see the national flag hanging up upon the wall, and he asked the child, Now, my boy, was it that flag? It is the English flag, sir. And what is the use of it? The truthful boy replied, It is used to cover the dirty place and the wall behind it. I need not interpret the parable. Let modern ecclesiastical, ecclesiastical history point to the moral. Do not let it be true of any of you that a lad with a professed orthodoxy is a mere coverlet for error, which is scarce secretly held. Nor, dear brethren, stick to the truth because the truth sticks to you. Whether it leads you, follow it down into the valley or aloft upon the hills, follow us to its heels and only fear to be left behind in its course. When the road is miry, never fear that you will ever be hurt by the splashes of truth. The truth of God is the best of all guests, entertaining it as Abraham did the angels. Spare not the best you have for its maintainers, for it leaves a rich. With those who deny themselves for it, but do not entertain any of the inventions of man, for these will betray you as Judas betrayed Christ with a kiss. Do not be dismayed by the caricature of truth which are manufactured by malicious minds nowadays it is the policy of men to misrepresent the, the doctrines. They remind me of Voltaire, of whom it is said that he could take any book that he read and make whatever he liked out of it and then hold it up to ridicule. Remember the Roman practice in persecuting times? They wrap Christians in skin of bears and set dogs to tear them to pieces. They treat us the same morally if we hold unpopular truth. I have seen myself in several skins lately. I can only say that there were no skins of mine. I returned to those who arrayed them, arrayed me in them. In our, if our declaration of truth are fairly and honestly stated and argued against well and good, but when they are misrepresented and tortured to mean what, what we never meant them to mean, then we are not careful to reply. When this happens to you, count it no strange thing. Reckon that because they cannot overcome the truth itself, they fashion an image of it stuffed with straw and then burned it with childish exultation. Let them enjoy the game as they may be. Brethren, I do not believe that God will set his seal to a ministry which does not aim at being strictly in accordance with the mind of the Spirit. In proportion as a ministry is truthful, other things being equal, God can bless it. Would you have the Holy Ghost set its seal to a lie? Would you have him bless what he has not written? Revealed, confirmed the signs of false, that which is not true. I am more and more persuaded that if we mean to have God with us, we must keep the truth. It is an almost invariable rule that when men go aside from all faith, they are seldom successful in soul winning. I could appeal to all observers whether it is not so. And whether men powerful in other ways do not become barren and fruitful as to the salvation of others when they become doubters rather than believers, if you inquire into the war, warm in which is devoured, worm which has devoured the root of their usefulness, you will find that it is the want of faith upon some great cardinal principle, a want of faith which may not be displayed in their public ministry, but lurks within, poisoning their thoughts. You must be with the Holy Ghost if you are to have the Holy Ghost with you. Beloved, have a genuine faith in the Word of God and its power to save. Do not go up into the pulpit preaching the truth and saying, I hope some good will come of it but confidently believe that it will not return void, but must work eternal purpose for God. Do not speak as if the gospel might have some power, or might have none. God sent you to be a miracle worker, therefore say to the spiritual lame, in the name of Jesus of Nazareth, rise and walk, rise, rise up and walk. And men will rise up and walk, but if you say, I hope, dear man, that Jesus Christ may be able to make you rise up and walk, your Lord will frown upon your dishonoring words, you have lowered him, you have brought him down to the level of your unbelief, and he cannot do many mighty works by you. Speak boldly, for if you speak by the Holy Ghost, you cannot speak in vain. All that we could make our people feel that we believe what we are saying. I have heard of a little girl who said to her father, who was a minister and who had been telling her a story, Pa, is the real or is it preaching? Pa, is that real or is it preaching? I cannot have jot to your smiling at my antidote, but it is a thing to weep over that preaching should be suspected of unreality. People hear our testimony and ask, is it a matter of fact or is it the proper thing to be said? 
If they saw a statement in the newspaper, they would believe it. But when they see it in a sermon, they say it's pious opinion. The suspicion is born of want of fidelity in ministers. I saw just now outside the shop a marine store dealer, a placard with runs, which runs thus, 50 tons of bones wanted. Yes, I said to myself, mostly backbones, 50 tons of them. I could indicate a place where they could take 50 tons and not be over, overstocked. As for us, let us be able to say, I believe, therefore I have spoken. Let us have a genuine faith in everything that God has revealed. Have faith not only in its truth, but in its power. Faith in the absolute certainty that it is to be preached and it will produce its results. Closely adhering to the truth by a dogged faith, we are in the condition in which God is likely to bless us. But then there must be the preaching, concentration of heart, the business in which we are engaged. We shall never do well in our sacred if half our energy goes to something else. The man who is doing a half a dozen of things generally fails in them all. Of course he does. We have not enough water in our streamlet to strive more than one million. If we let it run over one wheel, the other wheel will turn purpose. But if we divide the water, it will do nothing. God's message deserves every fragment of my ability. And when I deliver it, I ought to be all there. Every bit of me, none of me should go astray or lie asleep. Some men, when they get into the pulpit, are not there. One said to me in conversation, I do not know how it is, but I feel so different when I shut up that pulpit door. I answered, have the door taken off. That might not, however, produce the effect. It should have been better if it could be said of him as of Noah, Lord, shut him in. Do not some show by their preaching that their heart is not in it. They have come to preach and they will get through what they have to say. But their deepest thoughts and liveliest emotions would come out of better at a political meeting. They have not all their wits about them when preaching. They are remind me of the legend of the two learned doctors down in the Feng country. We thought that they would have a day of shooting of wild ducks. They were extremely learned, but they were not at home in the common pursuits. They came to a piece of water into which it was necessary for them to wait to get at the docks. And one said to the other, I have not put on my water boots. And the other replied, I have forgotten my boots to put, ne but never mind. They both waded in, for they were keen sportsmen. They reached a sufficient nearness for shooting the ducks. Then one whispered, now brother, fire at them. The brother replied, I have forgotten my gun. Haven't you brought yours? No, said the other. I did not think of it. They were sportsmen for you. There were sportsmen for you. Their deep thoughts had made them unpractical. Their Hebrew roots had displaced their common sense. Have you never seen such preachers? They are not there. Their minds are in the profound abyss of critical unbelief. The Holy Ghost will not bless the men of this sort. He spoke by an ass once. But that ass showed its sense of speaking any more. And I know creatures of like kind, not hassle wise. Now, dear friends, see what I am driving at. I hope that I shall not miss it. It is plain to every thoughtful mind. That if we are not all together in a work, we cannot expect a blessing. God the Holy Ghost does not work by a torso or by a bust. He uses the whole human manhood. See a tradesman in a poor quarter on a Saturday night outside his shop. He walks up and down and cries, bye, bye, bye. With vehemence, he loots every passerby. He presses his commodities. He is everywhere at once. He compels men to come in. He urges each one to be a purchaser. So also must we serve the Lord with all diligence if we hope for success in our calling. <laughs> third part absolutely brilliant piece of writing by Spurgeon here absolutely amazing if we would have the Lord with us in the delivery of our message we must be in dead earnest and full of living zeal do you not think that many sermons are prepared until the juice is crushed out of them and a zeal could not remain in such a dry hus. Sermons which are studied for days, written down, read, reread, corrected, further corrected, and embedded, are in great danger of being too much cut and dried. You'll never get a crop if you plant boiled potatoes. You can boil a sermon to a turn so that no life remain in it. I like in a discourse to hear the wild bird notes of true nature and pure grace. These of charm unknown to the artificial and elaborate address. The music which we hear of a morning in the spring...
bring us freshness in which and with him birds cannot reach. It is full of rapture, alive with variety and feeling. It is a treat to hear a really good local preacher tell out his experience of how he came to Christ and relate it in his own country unaffected way. Nature beats art all to nothing. A simple hearty testimony is like grapes crushed fresh from the vine who would lay a bunch of raisin by the sides of them. God gave us sermons and saved us from essays. Do you not all know the superfine brother? You ought to listen to him. For he is clever. You ought to be attentive to his word for every sentence of that paste that Paper cost him hours of toilsome, toilsome composition, but somehow it falls flat and there is an offensive smell of stale oil. I speak advisedly when I say that some speakers want knocking out of their studies and turning out to visit their people. A very good preacher once said to me, I feel discouraged for the other Sunday. I did not feel at all well, and I preached a sermon without much study. In fact, it should talk as I should give it a subtle in bed in the middle of the night, and in my shirt sleeve told out the way of salvation. Why, sir, my people came to me and said, what a delightful sermon. We have so enjoyed it. I felt disgusted with them. And when I have given them a sermon that took a full week and perhaps more prepared, they have not thought anything of it, but this unstudied address quite won their hearts. I replied to him, if I were you, I would accept the judgment and give them another sermon of the same sort. <laughs> I love this guy's version. So long as the life of the sermon is strengthened by it, you may prepare to the utmost. But if the soul evaporates in the process, what is the good of such injurious toil? It is a kind of murder which you have wrought upon the sermon, which you have dried to death. I do not believe that God, the Holy Ghost, cares one single atom about your classical composition. I do not think that the Lord takes any delight in your rhetoric or in your pretty or even in your marvellous peroration to conclude the discourse after manner of final display at all Vauxhall Gardens when a profusion of all manner of fireworks closed the scene. Not even by the magnificent final does the Lord work the salvation of sinners. Even if there is fire, life and truth in the sermon that the quickness spirit will work by it but not else. Be earnest and you need not be elegant. The Holy Spirit will help you us in our message. If there is an entire dependence upon him, of course you'll all receive this at once, but do you entirely depend upon the Holy Ghost? Can you, dare you, do that? I would not urge any man to go into the pulpit and talk what first came into his head under the pretense of dependence upon the Holy Spirit, but still there are methods of preparation which denote the utterance absence of any trust in the Spirit's help in the pulpit. There is no practical difficulty in reconciling our own earnest endeavours with a humble dependence upon God. But it is very hard to make this appear logical when we are merely discussing a theory. It is the all difficulty of reconciling faith and works. I heard of a good man who had a family prayer and com commended his house and household to, to the care of God during the night watches. When burglaries became numerous in the neighbourhood, he said to a friend, After you have asked the Lord to protect your house, what do you do? His friend answered that he did nothing more than usual. Well, said the first, we have put bolts at top and bottom upon all our doors, and we have a lock and a chain. Besides that, we have the best patent fastenings on all the windows. All that is well enough, said his friend. It's not, is, that, is not that enough? No, said he. When we go to bed, my wife and I have two bolts on the door of the bedroom and a lock and a chain on the door. I have also got a spearhead fixed on a pole and my wife an electric apparatus which will ring a bell and give an alarm outside. His friend smiled and said, All that is faith in God, is it? The God replied, Faith without works is death. Yes, said the other, but I should think that faith with so many works will be likely to be smothered. There is a medium in all things. I should not pray God to take care of me and then leave my front door unfastened and my windows open. So I should pray for the Holy Ghost and then go into the pulpit without having carefully thought upon my text. No, still, if I had prepared thoughts and expressions so minutely that I never varied from my set form, I should think that my faith was to say the least encumbered with more works than would allow her much liberty of action. I do not see where the opportunity is given to the Spirit of God to help us in preaching if every jot and tittle is settled beforehand. Do let your trust in God be free to move hand and foot. While you are preaching, believe that God, the Holy Ghost, can give you in the selfsame hour what you shall speak and make you say what you have not previously thought of, 
Yes, and make this newly given utterance to be the very arrowhead of the discourse which shall strike deeper into the heart than anything you have prepared. Do not reduce your dependence upon the Holy Ghost to a mere phrase. Make it more and more a fact. Above all, dear friends, if you want a blessing of God, keep up constant communion with God. We get into fellowship with God at this conference. Do not let us get out of communion with God when we go home. When may I, a Christian safely be out of communion with God? Never. If we always walk with God and act towards Him as children, towards a loving Father, so that the spirit of adoption is always in us and the spirit of love always flows from us, we shall preach with power and God will bless our ministry from then. We shall know the utter mind of God. I must add here that if we are to enjoy the power of God, we must manifest great holiness of life. I will not ask any brother to profess that he has a higher life than the other believers, for if he did so, we might suspect that he had not very eminent degree of humility. I would not invite any brother to talk about having more holiness than his brother ministers, for he is, For if he did so, we might fear that he hung out the outward sign because the inward grace was absent. But we must have holiness to a high degree. Unholy living, how can God bless it? I heard of one who on a Sabbath morning said to his people, I was at the play last night and I saw so and so, and he used what he saw as an illustration of his subject. It saddened me to hear the story. May like never be done again. Alas, acts of worldly conformity are not only tolerated nowadays, but they are in some quarters commended as signs of a large mind. If a man can enjoy the theatre, it is his own concern. But when he invites men to hear him preach, I decline to accept his invitation. Even worldlings look with scorn upon loose habits of a preacher. I know a certain clergyman who is fond of cards, speaking to a man servant, a friend said, Where do you go on a Sunday? I suppose you attend the church. The place is being very near. No, son, I never go in here, the gentleman. Why not? Well, he said, you know, he's very much taken up with card playing. Yes, said my friend, but you play cards yourself. This was the answer. Yes, I play cards, but I would not trust my soul with a man who does it. I want a better man than myself to be a spiritual guide. The remark is open to many criticisms, but there is about a ring of common sense. That is how the world regards matters. Now, if even men of the world judge trifling preachers to be unfit for their work, depend upon the Holy Ghost does not better opinion of them. And he must be sorely vexed with unspiritual unholy intruders into the sacred office. If we can lie, if we can be unkind to our families, if we do not pay our debts, if we are notorious for levity and little given to devotion, how can we expect a blessing? Be you clean that bear the vessels of the Lord. As I have said before, he does not mind what vessel he is, even though it be of the earth or of wood, but it must be clean. It is not fit for the master's use if it is not clean. Oh, that God would keep us pure and then take us in his own hand for his own purpose. Once more, if we are to be robed in the power of the Lord, we must feel the intense longing for the glory of God and the salvations of the souls of men. Even when we are most successful, we must long for more success. If God had given us many souls, we must pine for a thousand times as many. Satisfaction with results would be a kernel, a knell of progress. No man is good who thinks that he cannot be better. He has no holiness who thinks that he is holy enough, and he is not useful who thinks that he is useful enough. Desire to honor God grows as we grow. Can you sympathize with Mr. Welsh, a Suffolk minister who once noticed to sit and weep, and once said to him, My dear Mr. Welsh, why are you weeping? Well, he replied, I cannot tell you. But when they pressed him very hard, he answered, I am weeping because I cannot love Christ more. That was worth weeping for, was it not? The man was noted everywhere for his intense love to his master, and therefore he wept because he could not love him more. The holiest minister is the man who cries, O wretched that I am, who shall deliver me from the, from the body of death? No common Christian sighs in the passion. Sin becomes exquisitely painful only to the exquisitely pure. That wound of sin, which would not be a pin's prick to a coarse of mind, seems a dagger wound to him if, he have, if we have great love to Jesus and great compassion for perishing men. We shall not be puffed up with a large success, but we shall sigh and cry over the thousands who are not converted. Love for souls will operate in many ways upon our ministry. Among other things, it will make us very plain in our speech. 
We shall say to ourselves, no, I must not use that hard word, for the poor woman in the aisle would not understand me. I must not point out that recondite difficulty, for yonder trembling soul might be staggered by it. I might not be relieved by the nation. I heard a sentence the other day which, which stuck me because of my, its finery rather than its weight of meaning. An admirable divine remark, when duty is embodied in a concrete personality, it is uh, eminently simplified. You all understand the expression, but I do not think that the congregation to which it was addressed had more than a hazy idea of what it meant. It is our old friend, example is better than precept. It is a fine thing to construct sounding sentences, but it is only an amusement. It ministers nothing to our great end. Some would impress us by their depth of thought, but it is merely a love of big words. To hide plain things in a dark sentences is a spot rather than a service for God. If you love men better, you will love phrases less. How you use your mother's to, to talk to you when you were a child. How you used your mother to talk to you when you were a child. There, do not tell me. Don't print it. It would never do for the public ear. Things that she used to say to you were childish and earlier still, a babyish. Why did she thus speak? For she was a very sensible woman because she loved you. There is a sort of toyage, as the French call it, in which love delights, love manners of addressing men, love's manner of addressing men disregards all the dignities and the fineries of language, and only carries to impart its meaning and infuse the blessing. To spread our hearts right over another heart is better than adoring it with paint and varnish, a brilliant speech. If you greatly love, you are the kind of man who knows how to feel for men and with them. Some men do not know how to handle a heart at all. They are like a stranger at a fish market who will so touch certain certain fish, they that are at once erect their spines and pierce the hands that touch them. A fish, fish wife is never heard that way, for she knows where to take them. There is a way of handling men and women, and the art is acquired intense love. How do the mothers of England learn to bring up their children? Is there an academy for material maternal intuition? Have we found a guild of motherhood? No. Love is the great teacher, and it makes the young mother quick and of understanding for her babe's good. Get much love to Christ and much love to the immortal souls, and it is wonderful how wisely you will adapt your teaching to your, the need of those around you. I will mention a few things more which are necessary to the full display of the power which regenerate sinners, with which regenerate sinners Sorry, I will mention a few things more which are necessary to the full display of the power which generates, regenerates sinners and builds up saints. Much care should be bestowed upon our surroundings. Brethren, do not think that if you go on Lord's Day to a place you have never visited before, you will find it easy to preach there as it is home among the loving praying people. Are you not conscious when going into assemblies that they are called as, as ice wells? You say to yourself, how can I preach here? You do not quite know why, but you are not happy. There is no quicker atmosphere, no refreshing dew, no heavenly wind. Like your Lord, you cannot do anything because of the unbelief around you. When you begin to preach, it is like speaking inside a steam bowler. No living hearts respond to your heart. They are sleepy company or a critical society. You can see it and feel it. How they fix their eyes on you and consecrate their spectacles, you perceive that they are in what a countryman may, may be called a, a judgmatical frame of mind. No good will come of your warm-hearted address. I have had great success in soul winning when preaching in different parts of the country, but I have never taken any credit for it, for I feel that I, I preach under great advantages. The people come with an intense desire to hear, with an expectation, expectation of getting a blessing, and hence every word has its due weight. When a congregation expel, expects nothing, it is generally finds nothing, even in the best of preachers. When they are prayed to make much of what they hear, they usually get what they come for. If a man goes fishing for frogs, he catches them. If he goes fishing for fish, he will catch them. If he goes to the right stream, our work is no doubt greatly affected for good or evil by the condition of the congregation, the condition of the church and the condition of the deacons. Some churches are in such a state that they are enough to baffle any ministry. 
A brother minister told me of a congregational chapel in which there has not been a prayer meeting for the last 15 years, and I did not not wonder when he added that the congregation had nearly died out and the minister was removing. It was time he should. What a it was time he should. What a blessing would he would not be somewhere else. But said he, I cannot say much about this state of things, for in my own church I cannot get the people to pray. The bulk of them have not been in the habit of taking public part in the prayers, and it seems impossible to get them to do so. What shall I do? Well, I replied, it may help you if you call in your church officers on Sunday morning before the service and ask them to pray for you, as my deacons and elders do for me. My officers know what a trembling creature I am, and when I ask them to seek strength for me, they do so with loving hearts. Don't you think that such exercise tends to train men in their art of public prayer? Besides, men are likely to hear better when they are prayed for the preacher, or to get around as a band of men whose hearts the Lord has touched. If we have a holy people about us, we shall be a better able to preach. Tell me not of a marble pulpit. This is a golden pulpit. A holy people are, a, are living what you preach. Make the platform for a pleader for Christ. Christ went up into the mountain and taught the crowds. And when you have a company of godly people around you, you do as it were, go up into the mountain and speak with the people from a favored elevation. We need a holy people, but alas, there is too often an Achan in the camp. Achan is more generally harbored than is used to be because goodly Babylonian is more generally honored than he used to be because goodly general Babylonian garments of wedges of silver are much in request and weak faith feels that it cannot do without these spoils. Carnal policy whispers, what shall we do with the chapel debt if the wealthy deacon leaves and his silver goes with him? We shall miss the respectability which his white goodly Babylonian garment his wife's goodly Babylonian garment bestows upon the place with very few wealthy people and we must strain a point to keep them. Yes, that is the way in which the accursed thing is allowed to debase our churches and defeat our ministries. When this pest is in the air, you may preach your tongue out, but you will not win souls. One man may have more power for mischief than fifty preachers have power for good. May the Lord give you a holy pleading people who, who he can bless. For large blessing, we must have union among our people. God, the Holy Spirit, does not bless a collection of quarreling, quarreling professors. Those who are always contending, not for the truth, but for petty differences and family jealousies, are not likely to bring to the church the dove-like spirit, want of unity always involved, want of power. I know that some churches are greatly at fault at this direction, but certain ministers never have a harmonious people. Although they change frequently, I am afraid it is because they are not very loving themselves. Unless we ourselves in good temper, we cannot expect to keep the people in good temper. As pastors, we must bear a great deal, and we have borne as much as possible and cannot bear any more. We must go over it again and bear the same thing again. Strong in the love which en endureth all things, hope of all things, we must quietly resolve not to take off fence, and before long harmony we will create where discord reigned, and then we may expect a blessing. We must plead with God that our people may be all earnest for the spread of the truth, the conversation, conversion of sinners. How blessed is that minister who has earnest men around him. You know what, what, what one cold-hearted man can do if he gets at your own Sunday morning with a lump of ice, freezes you with the information that Mrs. Smith is offended and all her family and their pew is vacant. You did not want to know of that lady's protest just before entering the pulpit and it does not help you. Another dear brother tells you with great grief he is so overcome that it is a pity his voice does not fail him altogether that one of the best helpers is very much hurt at your not calling to see him last Friday when you were a hundred miles away preaching for a struggling church. You ought to have called upon him at any inconvenience so the brother will tell you and he does his duty with a heart as cool as a cucumber. It may even happen that when you come down from the mount where you have been with God and preach with your soul on fire that you come right down into a cold bath of commonplace remark which lets you see that some of your hearers are out of sympathy with both with your subject and yourself. Such a thing is a great hindrance not only to your spirit but to the spirit of God. 
But the Holy One notices all this unkind and unspiritual behavior. Brethren, what a sort we have to do, what a work we have to do, unless the Spirit of God comes to sanctify these surroundings, how can it ever be done? I am sure you feel the necessity of having a true praying people. Be much in prayer yourself, for this will be more effectual holding your people for not praying. Set the example, draw strings of prayer out of the really gracious people by getting them to pray whenever they came to see you, and by praying with them yourself whenever you call upon them. Not only when they are ill, but when they are well, ask them to join in prayer with you. When a man is upstairs in bed and cannot do any hurt, you pray for him. When he is downstairs and can do no end of mischief, you do not pray for him. Is this wise and prudent? Oh, for a pleading people. The praying legion is the victorious legion. One of our most urgent necessities is fervent, importune prayer. Brethren, in addition to cooperation in service, we need that our friends should be looking out for souls. When a stranger comes into the chapel, somebody should speak to him. When a person is a little impressed, an earnest brother should follow him up with a stroke. Let each man be thinking of the responsibility that rests upon him. I should not like to handle the doctrine of responsibility with the view of proving that it squares with the doctrine of predestination. It does so earnestly. I believe in predestination without cutting and trimming it, and I believe in responsibility without adulterating and weakening it. Before you, the man of God, place a quiver full of arrows, and he bids you shoot the arrow of the Lord's deliverance. Bestir yourself and draw the bow. I beseech you, remember that every time you shoot, there will be victory for Israel. Will you stop at the third shooting? The man of God will feel angry and grieved if you are thus straightened, and he will say, Thou should have smitten five or six times when Syria would have been utterly destroyed. Do we not fail in our preaching and our very idea of what we are going to do and the design we set before us for accomplishment? Having laboured a little, are we not very satisfied? Shake off such base content. Let us shoot many times, brethren. Be filled with a great ambition, not for yourselves, but for the Lord your God. Elevate your ideal. Have no more firing at the bush. You may in this case shoot at the sun himself, for you will be sure to shoot higher if you do so than if some groveling object were your aim. Believe for great things of a great God. Remember when, whether you do so or not, great are your responsibilities. There never was a more restless time than now. What is being done today will affect the next centuries unless the Lord should very speedily come. I believe that if we walk uprightly and decidedly before God at this time, we shall make the future of England bright with the gospel. But trimming now and debasing doctrine now will affect children yet unborn generations after generation. Austerity must be considered. I do not look so much at what it is to happen today, for these things relate to eternity. For my part, I am quite willing to be eaten by dogs for the next 50 years the more distant future shall vindicate me. I have dealt honestly before the living God. My brother, do the same. Who knows but what thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this. If thou hast grit in thee, quit thyself like a man. If thou hast God in thee, then thou mayest yet do marvels. But if not, bend, double up, proven to be useless. Thou shalt lie in that foul dunghill which is made up of cowards, failing and misspent lives. God save both thee and me from that. I would end our sense of responsibility by the remembrance of the deathbeds of our people. Unless we are faithful to them, it will be a painful sight to be set present when they come to die. Suppose that any one of our hearers should stretch out its bony band. I am lost and you never warned me. You always gave me some idea that it might might be a little way roundabout, but I should get right all the same. I should choose the roundabout way of the larger hope instead of the divine hope that is set before in the gospel. I would rather never have been born than have anybody speak thus to me when he shall come to die. My brother said to me the other day what Charles Wesley said to John Wesley, Brother, our people die well. I answered, Assuredly they do. I have never been in the sickbed of any one of our people without feeling strengthened in faith, in the side of their glorious confidence. I could sooner battle with the whole earth and kick it before me like a ball than have a doubt in my mind about the gospel of the Lord. They die gloriously, 
and I saw last week a dear sister with cancer just the under her eye. How did I find her? Was she lamenting in her fa hard fate? By no means she was happy, calm and joyful in bright expectation of seeing the face of the king in his glory. I talked with a tradesman not long ago who fell asleep, and I said, You seem to have no fears. No, he said, How can I have any? Not told us that we shall make us fear. How can I be afraid to die since I have fed these thirty years on the strong meat of the kingdom of God? I know whom I have believed. I had a heavy time with him. I cannot use a, a lower word. He exhibited a holy mirth in the expectation of speedy removal to the better world. Now, brethren, suffer one last word. You and I will soon die ourselves unless our master comes. And blessed will be it for us if then we lie in the silent room and the nights grow weary and our strength ebbs out. We can stay ourselves upon the pillows and say, O Lord, I have known thee from my youth and hereof I declare thy wondrous works. And now that I am about to depart, forsake me not. Thrice happy shall we be if we can say in the last article, I have not shunned to declare the whole counsel of God. Brethren, I resolve... God helping me to be among those who shall walk with our Lord in white, for they are worthy. They are, these are they, it is said, who have not defiled themselves, entered into no contracts and confederates that would have stained their conscience and polluted their hearts. These are they who have walked apart from this dear sake, but for, for his day's dear sake, obeying his word. Come out from among them, be ye separate, touch not the unclean thing, and I will be a father unto you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, said the Lord Almighty. A special enjoyment of adoption is given to the conscience that is true to the separate path and is never degraded by compromise. God help you in this. I believe that infidelity will be your power. You may well make a little slit in your conscience, said one to a Puritan, for other people make great rents in theirs. Yes, said he, you can call me precise but I serve a precious, precise God. Hear you that solemn word. I, the Lord God, am a jealous God. His jealousy burns like cold fire and is cruel as the grave, for God is so sternly jealous of those he loves much that he will not bear in them that which he will endure in others. The greater his love, the more fierce his jealousy, if any way his chosen depart from him. I will be gone a year long. You will meet and say to one another, The President has departed. What are we going to do? I charge you, be faithful to the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ and to the doctrine of his grace. Be ye faithful unto death, and your crowns will not be wanting. But all oh, let none of us die out like dim candles, ending a powerless ministry in an everlasting blackness. The Lord himself bless you. Amen. Charles Spurgeon. May God bless you, and I hope that this message of his about part the preacher's power be a blessing to you. May God bless you.